Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 106, we're going to talk about how to find affordable tubes, the Russian equivalents. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, so everyone who buys vintage tubes has noticed how expensive they become in the last two years. Today, in my continuing series on how to find affordable tubes that sound great, we're going to look at Soviet tubes that are equivalents, close equivalents, and or superior to the Western tubes that they copied. Now this is just an overview, but it's to give you a sense for how diverse um, the Soviet uh, equivalents are. So let's just start over here at this end. This is a current pusher. This is the 6080. And this is a very popular tube for uh, head OTL headphone amplifiers. And OTL just means that it's a transformerless amplifier, which is a thing. It has a very unique sound. And this is the more modern version of the 6AS7G. And they're identical electrically, I believe. And here's the Soviet equivalent. And I'm not going to do every single number because it's going to take forever. But this one here, in the Russian Cyrillic, this reads 6H13S. And if we translate that into the Western alphabet, it becomes 6N13S. Did I say 13C before? Anyways, um, the important thing to remember is when you're looking for equivalents, the uh, Eastern European tube sellers use the Western alphabet, not the Cyrillic. About 90% of the time, that's the case. Sometimes they'll use both but don't get confused by that. Now, this is a famous logo. Most of you know that this is the, this is the flying or winged sea logo of Svetlana. And Svetlana was in St. Petersburg, um, USSR, and um, St. Petersburg was the name uh, before uh, it became Stalingrad, right? And that now, nowadays it's now, again, it's St. Petersburg. And it's also known as the second capital of, um, of Russia. Now, take a look at the date on this. I don't know if you can see, it's quite faint. In fact, let me get my, there. <laughs> Let's get the light on. Duh. Okay, 1960. No wonder you couldn't see it. And I think that's a two. So this is February, 1960. These are brand new tubes. I actually have quite a few of them in stock. I sell them to a lot of people who um, use them in OTL amps, and they are great tubes. Up here, we've got a very common Western power tube, the 6L6. This is the G version. And this is actually a fairly unique type of the 6L6 because it's got double side getters, which is a thing you see every once in a while. It makes for a more compact tube. Uh, because they don't need to put the getter on top. They don't need any shielding or anything up there. So that's, I think that's really why we're seeing it, is they wanted to make as compact a tube as possible. So there's definitely an equivalent to the 6L6. And this is the reflector. That's the reflector label. This, this particular tube's from 1979. These are beautiful tubes. They sound great. They are robust, long-lived tubes, and they look great. They've got one of the last innovations of the second tube era. Uh, they've got the wafer base. Now, of course, the uh, Soviets continue to make tubes even after most of the Western plants had already closed, and they continued. And we have a debt of gratitude uh, to those plants, uh, particularly the great ones like Svetlana, who kept on going. Reflector became eventually the manufacturer of the reissued tubes from new sensors. So the reissued Mullard, the reissued Svetlana, Gold Lion, 
tongue saw, I mean, the list goes on and on. And ref like many tube manufacturers, Reflector had good tubes and mm, meh, not so good tubes. And that continued on into the reissue period as well. This is one of the good ones. Okay, here's a very common Western power tube years ago, the 6V6 GT. And th you could, this is the GE version with smoke glass. You could find this tube in car radios, in um, tabletop uh, radios, uh, consoles, even, uh, it was even very common in guitar amplifiers. And, and of course there's an equivalent. Here's another Svetlana. Uh, dated 1956 with a uh, inside smoked glass that's virtually black. I mean, it's really quite dark. And of course, that's to help shield the tube. Years and years ago, in the first tube era, into the early part of the second, um, the uh, this, uh, coating the glass was actually quite common. And then it it got less and less common. I'm not really sure why. Maybe somebody knows can pop a comment in for us. Anyways, uh, Svetlana made these, Reflector made these, and the later Reflector ones actually increased the spec of the tube. Um, and Reflector had a Western brand name that was called Sovtech. Ah, many of you are saying, oh, okay, so now I understand that. Whereas Svetlana always kept uh, various logos. They had a lot of logos, uh, many of them versions of this Flying C. They also had a big stylized SED uh, logo or stylized S. Um, anyways, we're not talking logos today, we're just talking about equivalents. You know, I can start going down these rabbit holes and I never come back out again. Um, here's a wonderful power tube. This is the Sylvania Black Plate EL84 and the Today, we mostly know it as the EL84, but in the Western numbering system, it's called the 6BQ5. Uh, and the, um, this was uh, designed, uh, invented, designed, and made by uh, Phillips Mullard. And it was designed as a miniature 9-pin version of the EL34, which, of course, they designed as well. And this is a powerful little tube, let me tell you, and it gets hot. It gets extremely hot. Fry an egg, burn a finger hot. Uh, and I've burnt myself on these tubes quite often. And of course, there is a very common Soviet era version. This is, you can't see the logo, it's quite faint, but it's, this is the reflector version. I believe they made the vast majority, if not all of the Soviet era uh, ELA-84 equivalents. Their number is the 6P14P. This is the dash K version. Whenever you see um, an affixed number or letter at the end, it's, it's always a letter, it, it tells you that the tube has some special qualities over the, over the common version. So I think dash K means that it, it can handle vibration, but I, I actually have forgotten now. But in actual use, the Dash K version of the of the EL84 has turned out to be an all-around extremely robust version. So it's probably um, beefed a beefed-up version all the way across the board. There's also a Dash EV. The E stands for extended life, and the V also stands for vibration. There's a couple of codes that sort of crisscross each other, uh, and this is very very common. Um, in fact, you might ask yourself, what was the most common power tube in use domestically in homes in, in Soviet times? That would be this tube here. As a used tube, they're extremely common. As a new stock, new in the box, or new in the case tube, it, they're not. They're actually quite rare. And the reason I think that is, is that it really wasn't that much of a military tube. If, if you look at what is available new old stock new in the case bulk case mostly it's military tubes and that's because during soviet times everybody had a job and everybody had a home and they couldn't cease production on a line because where would they put somebody so what they did was when they 
ran out of uses for a product that they were manufacturing, let's say the tubes, like the EL84, well, this is a bad example. The GU50 is a better example. Or this one here, we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, they just built a warehouse and filled it up. And I think what we're seeing now, and have been seeing for the last number of years, is those warehouses have gotten old. The tubes aren't needed anymore for military use. So they're being auctioned off. I think that's what's going on. If somebody has more information, please jump into the comments. Okay, so this is almost exactly a 12AX7. It's the 6N2P. This is the dash EV version, so extended life and vibration. Um, so it's basically a mil-spec tube. It's got gorgeous um, coated plates. Um, but unlike the 12AX7, it's a six volt tube only. Uh, but in circuit, it's a drop in equivalent. Pinout wise, it's not. So it's not a direct substitute. Let me repeat that in case somebody wants to go and grab one and toss it into a 12AX7 uh, socket. It won't work. It doesn't have the right voltage. Now, putting 12 volts on six volt filaments, of course, means that the six volt filaments will leave this earth rapidly. Um, but if you are designing uh, a new uh, a new preamp or amplifier and you need the gain of a 12x7, which is roughly 100, then this is a great tube. In fact, two or three Christmases ago, my Christmas build project was a prototype phono preamp. And I used the 6N2P, and wow, this tube sounds amazing. It's got the three C's. It's clean, clear, and crisp. It's got drive. The music just pops off this tube. It's got great gain, of course. And best of all, it's a quiet tube. Have a look at why. I don't want to spend too much time on it because um, we've got two phono preamps in development that hopefully will become kits and we'll talk more about this tube in depth but look at pin 9 now on the 12ax7 pin 9 is a tap on the filaments it allows the tube filaments to be universal so they can do a lot you can do a lot of things with a 12ax7 uh, pair of filaments including running it at 6 volts and 12 volts serious series stringing it um, in this case though pin 9 is the shield and I'll just get it up here so you can see it and that's that little plate of metal between and what that does is help isolate the sections the 6DGA type has the same technology this is essentially a refinement of a Western tube that made in my opinion huge improvements on the noisy 12AX7 a great tube okay so you might say what about large power tubes that are uh, that were made in Soviet times that are equivalents? Well, there aren't any, not for domestic use. They, you know, they didn't have huge amplification requirements that I'm aware of. But there are tubes that have lots of amplification capabilities that were designed for other things, and for example, the GU50. Uh, and we're going to talk more and more about this as the um, as the kits get ready for test builders. Now, what this is is a high-powered uh, beam pentode that was that was and is used for military radios, and it's a copy of a German Siemens tube design, and they are fabulous. The first time I saw this, I knew that they would sound great, but the reality is that they sound 10 times better than I imagined. And they are robust in testing and circuit design. We tried to kill these things, and they're next to impossible to kill, though we have killed some, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but that's all in the name of development, right? Moving, the, moving forward. Um, but anyways, uh, this, this doesn't really have a modern equivalent on the western side. It had an old equivalent, of course, during World War II, uh, but those tubes aren't in use anymore in the west. Those radios are all solid state and have been for decades and decades. Anyways, what to take away from this? Well, 
often the Soviet tubes are available in new old stock, usually bulk packs. So you don't get a box, so you've got to look at your tubes when they come in. And you know, I always say look at the pins to see if they've been in use. And especially the base pin here, has it been in and out of a socket? It's not very common to find Eastern European tube sellers selling used tubes as new old stock. That's just not a thing. They're actually, most of them are very good um, people to deal with. They're good business people. They want you to come back and buy more. Um, so often uh, there is an, if there's a new old stock vintage uh, equivalent that was made in Soviet times that is at least as good as the Western tube. And they're often available in quantity. They're more affordable. Many of them, particularly the Svetlana tubes, are rock solid and highly reliable. The Meltz tubes as well. And they're just a good alternative to finding an affordable vintage tube. So hopefully that helps you get on the road. And don't be put off by the numbers. Find out, use Google, find out what the equivalents are um, and get the Western number and Western designation. 90% of the listings are all done with the Western number. So you don't need to know what the Cyrillic is. You need to know what the translated Western number is. Okay, so what's going on over at Melotone Kits? Well, while Charles is away, I'm going to work on getting the GU50 monoblocks ready for the test builders. This week, I worked on the plinths. Now, plinth is just a fancy word to describe a wooden box. <laughs> so why don't we call it the wooden box? Well, for obvious reasons, nobody would buy a wooden box, would they? Even if it was made out of black cherry, my favorite wood. Now, the GU50 is the biggest amp we've ever developed. It's heavy. It's at close to the maximum size our standard case can take. And I decided to make the plinths taller. So here's our stand. This is a, the faceplate of a of a um, of a preamp. Here's where the volume knob gets recessed, and take a look at how it compares to the new size. This will be the faceplate of the GU50. Let me back this out just a little bit so you can see what the heck I'm showing you. And um, these, this is the raw milled version. Of course, it hasn't been finished, sanded, or assembled. I love black cherry. It it ages to a beautiful dark, rich brownish, reddish brown patina. When I had the cabinet shop years and years ago, I worked a lot in black cherry and in maple, and often I would do designs with the two of them intermixed. Maple, of course, is a white wood along with this beautiful dark wood, and um, they just went together just gorgeously, just absolutely beautiful. Anyways. I could talk about wood all day long, but this is a tube show. So the GU50 is going to have a, a little more robust looking plinth. And I think it actually will look better as a result because the iron on top is big. The power tube is big. Everything is bigger and it weighs a ton, of course. Okay. Now, this has actually been a fairly slow week, but what did come in is fabulous. Hang on a second. Let me grab it. So some more tongues came in, and these are the tall uh, boy versions. Let me open the, these boxes fall apart so easily. Let me open this box carefully. Here's the tall boy. They're all new old stock. Yes, they're very expensive tubes. Um, one of the most expensive single tubes that I sell. Uh, in my opinion, though, they're worth it. They sound absolutely amazing. It's probably one of the best of the 6S N7s ever made. Them, the Tongues and the Slovenias are my favorites. The Tongue GTB has an amazing amount of clarity. It just goes on and on. The depth of clarity is just unbelievable. In fact, I was, I, I have to, I do live testing of the expensive tubes when they come in right away after I electrically test them. So I f find what they are electrically. So that's your GM nominal number, 100 being 100% or new old stock equivalent. Tongues have an average of about 10% less than the nominal. So 
more commonly a newel stock tube will test somewhere in the high 80s, early 90s, low 90s. And um, the, um, the, the, and then what I do is I match them up electrically and I'll listen to them. And I was listening to uh, Muddy Waters' album, um, Folk Singer, I think it's called. And that is one of the few of the blues albums that you would call an audiophile album. Muddy Waters' voice, uh, the instrumentation, it's like it comes from this black background. It's just, I'm playing it right now, I'm putting as many hours on the GU50 monoblocks as I can, trying to break them. And so far, uh, other than discovering uh, a fuse size that was a little small, um, they've been absolutely perfect. And playing Muddy Waters' folk singer was unbelievable. It was such a treat. In fact, I listened too long. <laughs> so I'm filming this a little late because even though I only had, mm, what did I have, a dozen tubes to test, it took me two hours. So anyways, um, uh, you know, between pauses and changing tubes. These are great tubes. Um, if you love detail, uh, you will love the tongues. Okay, well, if you stay to the end and you listen to all my rambling, um, remember I've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if you live in a zone in which you know the shipping is going to be a challenge, don't take a discount. And that what that'll do is it'll help offset the extra cost of getting to you. You know who you are. Um, and many of you don't do that. And that helps a lot with, um, with shipping costs because I often pay two or three times as much to get to you guys. And, but if you're in a difficult zone I and your order's over $150, or if you're in any zone, um, the shipping is free after $150. And people that are in really tough places to ship to, very expensive places, sometimes will get a note from me saying, you know, could you add an extra 20 bucks to the order? Um, so if you've already not taken a discount, then that helps a lot as well to getting that out to you affordably. Anyways, Stay safe, everybody. Have fun. This is Jim from Valves and More, signing off. Cheers, everyone.